Thank you. Our next session, ladies and gentlemen, Sustainable Solutions. Our keynote speaker for this session is Honorable Minister of Railways, Commerce and Industry, Consumer Affairs and Food and Public Distribution, Government of India, Deputy Leader of the Rajya Sabha, Shri Piyush Goyal. It is our absolute pleasure to have him here today. He was earlier the Minister of Railways and Coal 2017 to 19. He has also held additional charge of Minister of Finance and Corporate Affairs twice in 2018 and 19. He was Minister of State Independent Charge for Power, Coal, New and Re Renewable Energy 2014-17. And mines 2016-17. Mr. Goyal's tenure has seen Indian Railways achieve its best ever safety record in 2018-19. The power, coal, and new and renewable energy ministries led transformational changes in India's power sector, including the fast tracking of electrification of the nearly 18,000 unelectrified villages in some of the remotest and inaccessible parts of the country. He has received the fourth annual Carnet Prize in 2018, recognizing the path-breaking transformations in India's energy sector. During his 35-year-long political career, Mr. Goyal has left, held several important positions at different levels in the Bharatiya Janata Party and is in uh, its national executive. Please welcome Sri Piyush Goyal, Honorable Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Madam. Rotarian Mr. Kamal Sangvi, District Governor Rotarian Sunil Mehra, my own club president, Rotarian Ashish Shah, all the other distinguished leaders of the Rotary movement, Ladies and gentlemen, my greetings to all the Rotarians present today. Thank you for this wonderful opportunity to engage with such a diverse set of people coming from all walks of life, but with a common intention to place service before self. As a member of Rotary myself, the Bombay Pier Club. I'm delighted to be amongst friends and colleagues, particularly from Mumbai, my home city, with whom I have traveled this journey of rotary and service. India today is coping with the impact of the second wave. But I think the collective efforts of all people in this group, in this room, and the people of India have helped the country face this challenge, go forward. And to my mind, we are at a situation where we can really look up to a bright future ahead of us. Solutions are being worked upon. The country is collectively engaged in finding ways to tackle the pandemic. And all of us have a common purpose in mind to look for a brighter future. When we were discussing what should be the topic of discussion. I believe logically, one would have thought we should be discussing the COVID situation. But I thought that the world moves on. While COVID will engage us for some more time, Rotary, all of us Rotarians, and the people of India are working towards a brighter future for the people of India. And I have no doubt in my mind that each one of us feels very passionately about taking this journey of India to a better future, fast tracking that journey 
and being an important element of this journey. I would like to take this opportunity to thank all the Rotarians who have contributed to the nation's fight against COVID. I would also like to pay my condolences to all those who lost their near and dear ones to this extremely tough situation, this global pandemic that has seen such debilitating consequences on all of mankind. Ladies and gentlemen, I thought it would be interesting to discuss sustainable solutions for next-gen mobility, because I do believe that as we work or fight against this current pandemic, we also have to be prepared for issues that will confront our nation in the future, that will confront the world going forward. We all recognize the colossal problem of climate change that the world is facing. Countries have realized that it is the next catastrophe looming large over all of us. Ultimately, there's only so much carbon that the atmosphere can take. And studies have shown that we are very close to exhausting the carbon space available to us. And all of us will have to look at sustainable solutions to ensure that the rising temperature does not go, as we had thought earlier, beyond two degrees, but as we realize now, beyond one and a half degree, beyond its current levels. World leaders have been grappling with this problem. They have been working towards greater degree of involvement of the people towards sustainability, recognizing the importance of mobility towards addressing the challenge of climate change. And therefore, I thought it would be an interesting subject to talk to all of you about. We have an ambitious global effort called the Conference of Parties that was initiated in Berlin sometime in 1995. And since then, over several engagements, the world has come together to find solutions to address this next big challenge before the globe of climate change. In fact, I'm delighted to share with you that under Prime Minister Narendra Modi's leadership, the COP21 at Paris made some outstanding progress in this global effort. And we were able to bring the whole world together to fight collectively against this next challenge before the world. In fact, I remember at Paris, literally all the countries of the world were vying for Prime Minister Modi's attention and leadership to find solutions to a problem that had evaded a solution for 20 years before that. I remember the number of meetings that were held with different world leaders. In fact, uh, I, I recall an incident where President Obama and Prime Minister Modi were to meet. And because Prime Minister Modi had another engagement with the Japanese Prime Minister, the meeting had to be rescheduled a little bit, which left us some time before Prime Minister Modi would come into the meeting. And President Obama came out of his holding room and started chatting with the then Environment Minister, Prakash Jaurekar, and he's also holding the portfolio now, and me, almost for 30 minutes. And tall, imposing personality that he is, he had one hand on my shoulder and one on Prakash Ji's shoulder, both of us from Maharashtra, incidentally, and was discussing with us and trying to share with us his serious concerns and the important role that India can play going forward in addressing this big challenge. Believe me, it was, it was very uh, empowering and very, very exciting to see that a world leader of his stature 
saw India as the solution going forward. And for so many years, the world always looked upon India as a part of the problem. But the reality is, India is the solution. And India will find the solutions to this very, very challenging problem of climate change. There was a time when we were being seen as a naysayer, whereas today, India is taking world leadership in addressing this challenge before the world. We all are aware that India never contributed to this problem in the first place. Our own share of carbon emissions is only 1.7 tons per capita per year, well below the global average of about five or six tons per year, and significantly lower than the United States, Australia, Canada, all the developed countries, which are well above 16 uh, metric tons per year per capita consumption of carbon space. India is making significant effort to address the problem, maintain our climate goals, keep our carbon emissions under control, and are working on sustainable solutions for a better tomorrow both for the people of India and for the rest of the world. In fact, it is this very high indiscriminate use of carbon by the developed world, which for which it was a very low cost energy solution at that point of time, the industrial revolution particularly, that actually helped them develop their economies, give a better life to the people of the developed world. But in the process, nearly 50% of the carbon which has damaged the ozone layer comes from the developed world. Therefore, the Prime Minister Shinarendra Modi in Paris came out with a very new concept of climate justice and sustainable lifestyle. And I'm delighted to share with you that this was accepted in Paris by the entire world. There has to be climate justice. Countries which are in the development cycle, the less developed countries, have to be given carbon space and an opportunity to develop their own economies for prosperity of the people who have been deprived of economic development for so many years. In fact, I don't know if any of you recalls Vice President Gore had come out with his treatise or his book, The Inconvenient Truth sometime in 2006. So that time the Prime Minister, Mr. Modi was the Chief Minister of Gujarat. And he came out with his own version, convenient action. And that's what he deeply believes in. That is at the core of the philosophy of all Indians. There is a problem, but visionary leadership is reflected in addressing that problem not fighting shy of it. He, he strongly believes that the globe and all countries will have, have to act decisively. And India, in that sense, is taking rapid strides to find sustainable solutions to address this challenge of climate change. In fact, uh, when uh, a, a press person had once asked Prime Minister Modi, around the time when the US and China had uh, agreed on a climate deal sometime in January of 2015. Whether India will like to make a similar commitment, Prime Minister Modi said, and I'd like to quote, India is a sovereign country. No pressure from any country or any pressure has any effect on India. But there is pressure. Pressure about what kind of earth we shall leave for the future generations. Climate change itself is a very big pressure. And whoever worries about the future generations has a responsibility to be conscious about climate change. I'm sharing this perspective to show you how addressing and combating climate change is not something India does out of compulsion but it is an article of faith 
for all of us Indians. And I assure you that we will all work together, you, me, the entire nation, to find solutions, implement solutions, and save our children from the very, very serious consequences that climate change can cause to countries, more particularly to developing countries. In fact, uh, mobility, I'm given to understand, causes almost one fourth, 23% of the, the impact that we have seen due to climate change. 23% of global pollution comes out of mobility, transportation. And therefore, global solutions and domestic solutions for reducing greenhouse gas emissions due to mobility have to be found, have to be worked upon. It also accounts for almost half of the current global nitrogen oxide emissions and dust emissions. Therefore, India in different ways, be it the road transport, be it railways, in every respect is taking rapid strides to address this challenge. As you are all aware, I'm also the railway minister of India. And the railways is working on a mission mode to contribute significantly for sustainability as the largest transporter of goods and people in the country. Since 2014, we have embarked on a series of measures to help reduce the impact of uh, carbon dioxide, the impact of carbon emissions on the globe, on, on, on India and on, on all Indians to reduce pollution. And therefore, I'll just give you a glimpse of some of the transformational initiatives that we are taking in the railways, which I do hope will make you proud about the way Prime Minister Modi and the government of India, along with the people of India, the several states are focused on this subject. Take the electrification of railway for, a, for an example. There is no railway of the size of Indian railways anywhere in the world, which is electrified completely. In fact, probably I'm told, subject to verification, that a railway like the United States Railway has single digit level of electrification. Obviously they find availability of diesel so cheap that they are able to get away with it. And for them, probably the concerns of climate change have not yet reached their railway systems. India also went through electrification before 2014, but would do at an average about 600 kilometers every year. We changed all of that. Prime Minister Modi took a conscious decision that we will be the world's first railway of this size and scale. We have about 130,000 track kilometers all across the country. He said we will be the world's first large railway to be 100% electrified and becoming diesel book, free of diesel, reducing pollution very, very significantly, bringing down the cost of our operations, saving money in terms of diesel consumption, reducing our foreign exchange burden on importing crude oil, and helping our cities and our countryside getting rid of the problem of pollution coming out of the electric coming out of the old diesel locomotives and will be a 100% electric railway by December 2023, barely two and a half years from now. Ladies and gentlemen, last year was a COVID year, but the Indian railways electrified 6,000 kilometers in only one year. Despite the challenges of COVID, in the effort to achieve our goal within the time frame, possibly even a few months earlier. We are now about 70% electrified. We are doing it very systematically, route by route, so that trains get converted to electric locomotive. 
we have significantly ramped up our electric locomotive program, ramped up our electrification program, reduced our diesel consumption. And by 23, you will be proud to be the owner as a citizen of India of the world's first fully electrified rail. That doesn't end there. By December 2030, in the next seven years thereafter, Indian Railway will move to using only renewable energy. We will convert all our systems so that our dependence on coal-based power will be brought to near zero and we will become a net zero railway, the first in the world by 2030. Something which will be transformational and have a significant impact towards sustainability. In fact, there are many other steps. We've moved all our railway systems to LEDs. We have removed all toilets from the past. Every train now has a bio toilet. And I don't know if you recall how terrible it was. The excreta all across the tracks, all across the country, the bad smell, the foul uh, feeling while traveling in the railways. I would dare say you will get no smell, no foul smell anywhere in the railways today because in the last seven years, we have converted all toilets to bio toilets. No excreta is put out on the tracks. It's improved safety. It's reduced the methane gases emission, uric acid on the track, the excreta on the track. It used to be almost 4,000 plus tons of excreta every single day on the tracks of the Indian railways at about 2.74 lakh liters being shoved on the tracks. All of that is history, ladies and gentlemen. We have today a Swatch railway. Our stations are clean, toilets well maintained, and railways working as a soldier in this fight against climate change and improving our railway system to make it more contemporary, more modern, and several other steps. I could go on maybe for half an hour, 45 minutes, talking only of the railways. One more small step I will share with you to all of those who recognize that water is an important element of climate change. Our rail coaches traveling long distances get really dirty. You know, a lot of muck and a lot of dust accumulates on the coaches. They were traditionally being cleaned with water jets, consuming huge amounts of water. I think nearly 15,000 liters for every coach. Ladies and gentlemen, we've been now able to save 96% of that. We have started setting up mechanized coach washing plants by which we brought down the consumption to about 20% and we recycle about 75-80% of that 20% by uh, recycling it and reusing it in the automatic coach washing plants. So effectively, 15,000 liters has come down to only 600 liters every time it goes into a wash. These are small steps, but will have transformational impact on sustainability. In fact, we are trying a new experiment. I hope it's successful. And at some stage, I would urge Rotary to take it up. It's about our garbage collection system. You know, when I was at Harvard way back in 2013, studying for a, uh, for a management program, while I used to take my evening walks, I saw dustbins of a little bit of a different kind all across the Harvard campus. On a detailed uh, inspection, I realized they were not ordinary dustbins. They had a solar panel on top. They had a compacting system in that. And periodically, they would compact all the garbage so that every dustbin could hold actually seven or eight times the original garbage holding capacity. 
Now look at the transformational impact, ladies and gentlemen. A brings down the number of dustbins that are required. B helps improve cleanliness. So if there is an opportunity to throw your garbage somewhere, one normally would do it. C, the trucks which come to collect the garbage now have to come only one out of eight times rather than coming eight times to remove the garbage out of that can. Four, the disposal of that waste is easier. It can go into a waste to energy plant or maybe a waste to biofertilizer plant and get used in a compressed form. It has multifarious damage. I'm only sharing this with you to tell you how we need holistic, comprehensive solutions. And now we are trying to see if we can create some such uh, systems which can help us give facilities in the trains at the stations for better cleanliness and reduce the impact that uh, all of these garbage related issues have on the climate. Ladies and gentlemen, on the road traffic, we have significant steps yet to be taken, significant steps already taken. Look at the BS6 specification for fuel. India is among the few countries that is ahead of the time and has accepted BS6 much before many other countries even in the developed world have done. Similarly, today, we are working towards an ecosystem that will promote electric vehicles in a big way. Electric vehicles are getting more competitive. Battery prices are coming down. We have had one program called for faster adoption of electric mobility, FAME 1. Now we are in FAME 2. We are looking at setting up charging stations all over the country, almost at every gas station, every petrol pump. We are looking at getting into development of hydrogen as a means of fuel for the future, which will also give us oxygen on the other hand. So it's a holistic effort on road transport to improve the quality of our vehicles, improve the fuel quality. We'll by another two years from now, we would be uh, blending 20% ethanol in our petrol which means that much less imports on the one hand, which means that much more money going to the agriculturist, the farmer, whose producers used to make ethanol, be it molasses, sugar, broken food grains, maize, and reducing pollution by 20% from the automobiles. I do believe the focus on CNG, now ethanol, going forward electricity, going further forward hydrogen, will help us power vehicles in a more sustainable manner. In fact, I, I personally believe we can also look at, and maybe some Rotarians may like to study it. You remember as kids, we used to go to the amusement park and there we used to play with the bumpy cars, which had a single connection with a mesh, electric mesh on the top, which used to power those bumpy cars as we drove them. Possibly in our cities, we could look at some kind of a mesh along the road and vehicles could easily, with a small battery backup, move in and out of lanes, moving into the electric powered lane, recharge their batteries. And as they move out of it, move to battery, switch to battery traction. And on a continuous basis, with very low battery requirement, we could actually see electric vehicles being used for public transport. Buses could work that way very well, especially in the large metropolitan cities. Similarly, look at the impact that shared mobility is having on climate, on sustainability. There was a time where everybody wanted to own a car. We are gradually moving to a situation where shared mobility is becoming the order of the day. In fact, it's moved to two wheelers also. And I remember an instance, I was in New York and I had a meeting with the CEO of the world's largest fund, 
and it was a holiday, so he'd flown in from his uh, hometown. He was actually celebrating a Jewish holiday that day. But he flew in, came to meet me, and when he was leaving on courtesy, I came down to leave him uh, at the pier in New York. And I realized he, he was getting into an Uber. And I said, Larry, uh, where's your car? My car can drop you. I knew he was going back to the airport. He said, no, I'm happy to just Uber it to the airport. I mean, that's the impact that the world's largest bank investment fund, CEO, prefers to Uber to the airport rather than get a chauffeur driven. He would have probably got a convoy of cars should he have desired. I very often just take the metro, particularly in Delhi, where we have very good connectivity between the airport and the uh, central Delhi. Just take a metro from the airport and you're in central Delhi in 14 or 15 minutes. So huge impact all of us can play as individuals and collectively as society to contribute to making mobility an instrument and a sustainable solution for addressing this big challenge of climate change. We have also come out with a vehicle scrappage policy recently, by which we hope that old vehicles, which are no more uh, very fuel efficient, can be encouraged to be replaced with modern fuel efficient vehicles. And I'm sure that steps like this be it in the railways, be it promoting waterways. We can have more and more inland waterways, which we are trying to promote in the rivers of India. All of these will be steps which will help bring sustainable solutions for next-gen mobility. This district conference really provides us a chance to discuss positive ideas for the future, because as every Rotarian, deeply believes in keeping service before self, my conviction is that every Rotarian also believes in intergenerational equity. And I think it is enjoined and it is our duty as concerned citizens to leave behind for the next generation a better world than the one that we inherited. Ladies and gentlemen, there are many small things we all can practice and contribute to making India, to making the world a better place to live in. As Neil Armstrong had commented when he landed on the moon, one small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind. Small steps taken by each one of us in a country of a 1.3 billion Indians will mean a giant strike where the collective effort of 1.3 billion people will transform the country, will transform the world. Ladies and gentlemen, COVID-19 has taught us big lessons for making mobility more sustainable. In pre-COVID-19 days, Things could have been different. Tomorrow, things are going to be more challenging. Let us all work together as we get back to normalcy. Let us all work towards a better future for our children, for our people. The future of mobility in India will be based on a connected, convenient, congestion-free, clean environment and a better means of transportation that you and I will all have to contribute. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Goodbye, good luck, stay safe, and stay healthy. Namaskar. Thank you, Honorable Minister. Thank you very much. I'd like to invite DG Sunil Mehra, RID Kamal Sangvi, convener, Rotarian Sailesh Bhatia, PDG Ajay Gupta, and President Ashish Shah to please thank our keynote speaker. Uh, hello, hello, friends. Uh, Piyush, 
you are too close enough to be called Mr. Piyush. I'll call you Piyush as a good friend. Thanks, Piyush, for always being with us all the time. Like your great speech on climate change, how India needs to India at the forefront of reducing pollution. And as a railway minister, you have bio toilets, the Swachh Railway Mission. How by 2030, the railways will be zero polluting with your drive and your passion, the way you run things. I'm not sure. You, I'm sure you'll do it in time and better than what you are what you are projecting. It was surprising to learn that 23% of the world pollution is through mobility. Wow, I didn't realize that. And also in your good experiences where you shared the biggest investment banker using an Uber to go to the airport speaks a lot. We all need to learn, not get our fancy chauffeur cars and saying, Idar leke jao mujhe, sir. Akela hai. So we need to learn a lesson there, Piyush. Thanks a lot, Piyush. And uh, what more can I say? Doing your hard work and passion at the helm of railways, we'll do everything what is possible. And Piyush, as a friend, would like to thank you because you've been there for the installation, for the first speaker meet, and for this big, great event we have. So I'd like you to thank you from all four of us. Namaste. Jai Hind. Thank you, Piyush. Thank you so much for, on behalf of uh, Bombay Pier, District 3141, Rotary Fraternity, Ajay Gupta, Kamal Sangvi, and Silesh. All of us, thank you so much for being here.